Okay, let's do a quick review because it's been like five weeks. So I'm just going to do a quick uh, run through and then we'll do faith uh, that works. First of all, uh, John 14, 8, right? I will not leave you as orphans, right? So that's, that's, sort, of the, that, that's sort of the problem. Uh, and it's a deep spiritual problem because the concern is uh, that we will lose contact with grace uh, and, and we'll, get, we'll lose touch with grace. Uh, and when you lose touch with grace, you forget that you are an adopted son and daughter of God. Uh, and, and that uh, can happen. And it's the same thing that, that Jesus was concerned with his disciples. I don't want you to think that you'll be orphans. I, my grace is sufficient for you. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we're always understanding that. And the answer uh, to the fact that we think that we lose touch with grace and that we're orphaned and we're without a family of God and we're without a heavenly father who cares and protects for us is what? I have given you the spirit of, what's the, what's the anecdote for orphans? Adoption. And the spirit of adoption it's the Holy Spirit. It's, 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 it's a formal title of the work of the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God, when, when Jesus sends another comforter, it's to comfort you with the fact that you are remaining in his presence. You are adopted. You are just as much in the presence of Christ today as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were. And that's hard to believe, isn't it? And that's what we have to drill down on uh, because uh, the same fear that you had is the same fear the disciples had. You're going to leave us as orphans. You're gonna, you, you know, you're going to take off and you might never come back. And he said, no, 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 no. I will send you another comfort, comforter and I will be with you always to the end of the age. And so the promise that he made is uh, the promise that you have. And it's hard for us to understand that the same spirit that dwells in us is the same spirit of God that raised him from the dead. And, and uh, you have all the presence of God that every one of the disciples had in your life. You do. You have been given the spirit of adoption. And because you've been adopted, it's Ephesians uh, 2, right? By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. So everything that has been done has been done for you, which means we have what kind of righteousness? A received righteousness, which is what Vince just said, an alien righteousness. It's not righteousness that we produce, it's righteousness outside of us. We're not a member of the family of God because somehow we earned our way in. We don't come up with a quid pro quo. We don't show up uh, at probate court or, or family court and say, hey, you know, um, I earned the right to have you as my father. That's not the way the system works. Uh, Christ comes and grabs us while we're dead in our trespasses and sins. We're in a morgue and he pulls us out and he said, I'm going to give you resurrection life and I'm going to adopt you into the family of God and all the righteousness that you have, the righteousness that you need to be reconciled to a holy father, the righteousness that secures your relationship and your permanence with me is an alien righteousness. It's nothing you can produce, it's nothing that you have, and it's nothing uh, that you ever will have on your own, but it's received, it's the gift of God, by grace you saved, through faith, and even that, not of yourself, is the gift of God, right? So that's Ephesians 2, and then that gives us what? That means we now have a new identity. Behold, all things have passed away and everything has become new. We are, the new, we are new creatures in Christ. And that new creature in Christ uh, is uh, something that means that we are being uh, transformed into the image of Christ. Uh, you are predestined to be what? Conformed to the image of Christ. People get all worried about the word predestination. I'm like, yeah, but finish the sentence. You're predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. What would be controversial about that? <laughs> I can't imagine what the controversy would be. That's precisely God's plan for you from all eternity, that you would look like Jesus, your elder brother. You're given a new identity. And that new identity, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says the same thing, is not 
an outward, remember what our new identity is? It, and it's not outward, it's not based on our social roles or our, our relig religious rights or our, our family legacy. It's not outward, we don't get a new identity, identity from that. It's not the modern identity, it's not inward, you know, through self-fulfillment and, and, uh, and self-expression and all that. Uh, it's not uh, outward, uh, it's not inward, it's what? It's upward. It's upward. So it's, it's an identity that's totally received as a gift of God. Our identity uh, is the identity of the risen Christ. We are now resurrected with him. We died with him and we have been raised with him to new life. We are born again. Well, what's it mean to be born again? Right? You, you're, you're a new creature in Christ. Uh, and, and, you know, this sort of surprised Nicodemus, who would have been the equivalent of a PhD theologian. You know, he was a very high-end educated person. And he, he didn't understand it theologically. Well, it's, you know, not all things work that way. Sometimes you just have the Spirit of God come and you say, I'm going to do this for you. And it, you know, kind of challenges your thinking. And that's exactly what has happened to you. You've been born again. You've been given a new identity. Uh, God has hit the reset button. You were dead and now you're alive with him. You were an old uh, creature. Now you're a new creature. Everything has passed away. Everything becomes new. And, and you start over in him. But the moment we do that, we think, aha, aha. That's kind of majestic. That's kind of a lot to think about. It's sort of like... You know, if, uh, if you give your kids a really good Christmas gift, what's their natural tendency to be nice to you for at least the rest of the day, right? I mean, it may not go a lot longer, but they, you know, they're gonna feel like, oh, I better be nice to dad, he was really good to me today. And, and uh, that's how we feel too, because we're humans. We, you know, our tendency is to want to, uh, to earn something, to work it out, to say that we did it ourselves. And so the more we understand the grace of Jesus Christ, the actually the more dangerous it can be. You can actually end up uh, wondering, well, I wonder what I can do for God because he did so much for me. And the answer is you can do nothing. You can do nothing. Uh, and that's a hard answer. You know, so, you know, I was, you've heard me do this before, so I'm not saying anything that you haven't heard, but Christianity, the definition of Christianity is what? Jesus plus nothing. Nothing that you can add uh, to Christ, nothing you can add to the work of Christ, nothing you can add to his righteousness, nothing you can add to what he has done to fulfill uh, all the promises of God. There's nothing that we can add to that, not a single thing, and that's hard for us to take at some level and, and fully understandable. And so then we talked about uh, Romans uh, 5, 17, right? Those who receive, what? The abundance of grace. That verse has three things. Those who receive the abundance of grace, that's what we were just talking about. Grace is abundant and free. This, you know, this, it, 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 it's so much that we can't imagine. Grace is radical. The mercy of God is completely so radical that your first instinct isn't to believe it at all. It's to say that that's not quite possible for God to love me that much. It's not that possible for him to redeem me that deeply. It can't be true that his grace is 100% sufficient. It's sufficient, but you know, probably I'm gonna to have to do a few things here now, and it's not true. It's an abundance of grace. So those who receive the abundance of grace, and what else does the verse say? The gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness, and there we go again. All through the, the text, it's the gift of righteousness. What will happen to those, remember what this is, Romans 5, uh, 17, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will do something. What will they do? They will, they will reign in life. You want life to work for you? You're gonna to have to build a life on the gift of righteousness and the abundance of God's grace. That's the only way it will work. And that's what, remember with the class, we called that the normal Christian life. That's the normal Christian life. And what makes Christian life abnormal, and we talked a lot about this in class, is when we, when we get off the rails and we start thinking it's not an abundance of grace, but you know, he gave us a little bit of grace, but 
I'm going to have to add some works to that. And it's, it's not a gift of righteousness. It's a little bit of righteousness, but boy, I'd really better come along and see what I can do uh, to be more righteous. But there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who seek for God. There's none who understand. There's nobody that righteous. So nothing that we can do will produce that. This is the normal Christian life. It's based on an abundance of grace, a gift of righteousness, and that's what causes us to reign in life. That's what makes life work, all right? And since that's true, uh, then last week we talked about uh, Hebrews 6.1, therefore leaving the elementary teaching about Christ. In other words, everything that we talk about that we think is being more religious, more spiritual, deeper life, you know, you hear these words, it's a deeper life. Uh, all these things actually uh, the scriptures talk about as elementary kind of baby is it's sort of like spiritual baby talk you know why do you submit to such decrees remember colossians says do not handle do not taste do not touch all which things have the appearance of godliness but not the wisdom thereof why do we do that because we're dying to earn our own salvation we just we can't imagine the, the grace so hebrews 6 says therefore leaving the elementary teaching about christ let us press on to maturity not laying again a foundation of dead works. Well, what was a dead work? It was a work that doesn't produce life. And what, uh, what work doesn't produce life? All of our works. <laughs> Everything that we do, every piece of work that we do, that we think somehow enhances our relationship with God, improves our, our reconciliation with Him, uh, uh, improves the fact that we're alienated from a holy God. Everything that we do is a dead work. It actually doesn't lead to life, it leads to death. The only person that was able to do a work that leads to life was the work of Jesus Christ in His life, death, and resurrection. And we subscribe to that work, that alien righteousness, and that's what gives us new life and everything that does not completely center itself, focus itself, have the pivot point on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as our only righteousness, as only that which is sufficient for our, our reconciliation to the Father, is only that which is sufficient to remove the alienation we have from God. Everything but that will kill us. It's a dead work, and it actually is something that's immature. It's the milk of the word. And I can't tell you how many whole denominations are built on the milk of the word. It's unbelievable. You know, they put it in their constitution and bylaws. You know, they regularize and normalize immaturity and call it spirituality. It's, it, it's a sad truth. So what that gives us is what? It gives us, if once we know that, that creates a different lifestyle. If we're going to reign in life, if that's a normal Christian life, then what we're really going to have is lifestyle repentance. Because remember, faith and repentance are two sides of the same coin. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you're a Christian. So faith and repentance, you can never de-link these things. Faith and repentance are always linked together. And so usually what happens is when people are thinking about their Christian life, they think of it this way. I had faith granted, Ephesians, Ephesians 2, I will grant that God gave me the gift of faith, by grace you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, that even that is the gift of God. Okay, he gave me the gift of faith, but you have to repent. That's true. You have to repent and confess your sins. And then what people think is, okay, I did that, and now, once having done that, at some particular time in, in, in the past, you know, that the night of the Billy Graham crusade, or, you know, the 15th time you went down to the altar on Sunday night and, and confessed your sins, uh, you know, now I live a life of faith that's delinked from repentance. But faith and repentance are never delinked. Our faith is always connected to repentance. Those are exactly the flip side of the same coin in Scripture. So faith and repentance are an ongoing lifestyle. The way that we continue to trust the Father is to repent and put our confidence in His righteousness. Because every moment that you don't repent of your righteousness is the moment that you don't trust Christ's righteousness. And that's not a one-time event. That's 
every single minute of the day. So what are you repenting of? You're not really repenting of your sin. I, I, can, I can get your average, you know, sort of Friday night down at the jail guy to repent of his sin. You know, if I go into the jail, uh, you know, when I was in Philly, they, they, I had to wear a collar because it's the only way, you know, they, they thought, well, maybe you won't at least get knifed. <laughs> you know, so I wear the collar in and go in for the jail visits, you know, so everybody know, be nice to the guy with a collar. <laughs> I mean, and, and I could come out with 15, 16 conversions a night. Easy. But I didn't believe it. <laughs> you know, they'll confess their sins really easy. But that's not the problem. You need to confess your righteousness. That's what you really need to repent of, your righteousness. And, and that's, that's what it means to have a lifestyle of repentance. Every single day of our life, when we're putting our faith and confidence in Christ, we are repenting of our righteousness and putting our confidence and our trust in the righteousness of Christ. That is what it means to be a Christian. And that's a moment by moment way of living. And that's what the Spirit of God is doing. You say, you know, the Spirit of God dwells in you. What does the Spirit of God do? He drives you to Jesus. He doesn't drive you away from Jesus. He doesn't fill you with yourself. He, you know, he's not making you stronger. Oh, I have the spirit in me so I can do all things. It's, yeah, yeah, it's not quite what that means. What you have is the spirit of Christ dwelling in you. So that the spirit of God who dwells in you is always driving you to Christ. And when you come to Christ, you come repenting. Because you come to Christ, what it means to come to Christ is to come and trust his righteousness for your life. So that's the lifestyle repentance, all right? You all caught up? So far, so good? Okay, so now we're gonna do faith that works. We have one worksheet tonight. Faith that works. And we're gonna start with uh, John chapter six. This is the work of God. Everybody talks about, we want to do the work of the Lord. Oh yeah? Well, what's that? And, you know, there's a lot of answers to that. But this is Jesus speaking, and who's he talking to? He's not talking to pagans. <laughs> he's talking to his disciples. And he's saying to uh, his disciples, who presumably by this point uh, believe, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. That's the, that's the work of God. In other words, it's, it's hard for us to think about it and, it, and it feels paradoxical. But your job, your work, is to continue believing. That's the work. And who are you believing in? You're believing in him and when the bible says him it's not it's not like you're believing in jesus as some sort of you know I, 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 iconic sort of spiritual personage you know the bible when it says in christ or in him it's it's sort of encompassing if i can put it this way all that he did for you in his life and in his death and in his resurrection all right that's the hymn that you're believing in. Uh, there is no Jesus divorced from his life, death, and resurrection. There's no other Jesus to believe in but that one. So uh, this is the work of God. This is your work. This is the work of God. That you believe in him who he has sent. And then Galatians 5, 5, and 6. For we, through the Spirit, by faith. How is faith expressed? Remember, this is... This is sort of a synonym for this, faith. How does that come? Through what? Your own energy? Uh, through your own intellectual um, acumen? No, it comes through the spirit. And this is the hardest thing uh, when uh, you're getting uh, Christians to begin thinking Christianly. You know, we, we adopt a lot of ideas about Christianity that frankly we just manufacture but the Bible is very explicit 
in the way that it describes things. And faith is one of those words that we use in a, such a variety of contexts that it's easy to get sloppy with the word. And usually what we mean by faith is, you know, we just are emotionally charged. I really had faith today. And that's another way of saying, you know, I, I was on a, an emotional mountaintop. And, and then when we conversely go into the valley and have a, maybe a, a sad day, we'll say just the opposite. I didn't have a lot of faith today. Well, just using it that way alone, and, you know, we could sort of go through many of these usages, but that way alone, neither one of those two things are faith. That, that's misuse of the word. So uh, the Bible talks about faith in a very explicit way. And, you know, you can go back and catch the whole uh, 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 discussion of faith and know what you believe. Uh, but it's most important to understand that your faith is a gift of God that comes to you through the work of the Holy Spirit. You are given the power to believe in Jesus. That is one of his gifts to you. And the more mature you are, remember we're leaving elementary things, right? You'll begin to talk that way. Uh, you'll say, I thank the Lord for giving me faith today to believe in Christ. That's how you believe in Christ every day. You haven't had one day in your life where you've believed in Christ unless that belief has been the gift of God's faith to you to do it. Because none of us have the ability in our own sinfulness to trust Christ for anything. Right? Isn't that why we weren't Christians in the first instance? Do you think that you got faith as an unbeliever and somehow magically in some, you know, maybe elevated moment of unbelief, you exercise belief? Think about that for a minute. It's... It's, it's a non sequitur, right? Belief only occurs because it is directed belief. There's an object to the belief. It's not faith in faith. Faith isn't an independently owned and operated franchise. It's not an island that's sitting uh, all on its own out there by itself. Faith is always connected to the object of faith, who is Christ in his life, death, and resurrection. They're never delinked. So you say, I have faith in a parachute. No, you don't. <laughs> I mean, I understand how you're using the word and all that, and I'm not going to bust your chops about that. But I'm saying as a matter, when we're starting to talk about scripture, the way that faith is used in the Bible is faith 100% of the time is connected to faith in Christ. All right? It's, it has an object. So, uh, so we read in, in Galatians 5, for through the Spirit, through the work of the Spirit, by faith, we're waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Jesus Christ, and this is what gets us, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything at all. But what does mean something? Faith working through love. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? So that's what we're going to unpack a little bit tonight. Uh, first of all, there's two ways of living, the uncircumcised way and the circumcised way. So uh, now maybe you haven't read Galatians in the last week or two. It's only a few pages. Go home and read it. It's interesting. Uh, but there's some, there's some cultural things going on there uh, that I'll, uh, I'll, let me explain really briefly in what Paul is going after uh, in Galatians. Um, and you ought to read it because this is where uh, the Apostle Paul rebukes the Apostle Peter. So that's worth reading right there. <laughs> That's worth reading right there. So what is going on? Uh, people had come into the Galatians church. Now remember, uh, in the early uh, part of uh, Christianity, uh, there were uh, two sort of distinct ethnic groups of people. Uh, there were those who had come to Christ, who had come to Christ out of their Jewish heritage, right? Uh, and their Jewish heritage was, you know, you don't eat pork and you get circumcised and, you know, you go to synagogue on Saturday and, you know, 
uh, you pay attention to the Torah. Uh, so that, that was all critical and important, and no, no good uh, Jewish adherent would ever ignore any of those things at all. Uh, the other group of people that were uh, getting saved left and right, remember 3,000 on one day at the day of Pentecost, and they all speak in tongues, uh, because why? They're delivering the gospel in known languages to people who can hear them, understand them, and come to Christ. It wasn't a mystical language, it was known languages to 3,000 people. Well, they weren't all Jews. <laughs> you know, there were a lot of Gentiles. And so a lot of people who had no history whatsoever, were not circumcised, didn't know from pork, from you know, venison. I mean, who cares what you eat, right? They're Gentiles. It, didn't, it wasn't part of their thinking at all. Uh, synagogue, what's, you know, who would go to synagogue anyway? You know, that you, you're lucky you could get them out of the, uh, the Temple of Apollos or something. You know, they, you know, they were they completely different ethnic background. And so uh, uh, the Galatian church was primarily full of Gentiles. And some uh, Jewish Christians came in uh, and began to uh, stir up things in the Galatian church, saying that the only true way to be a believer was to follow uh, circumcision, which would mean all the rituals of, of uh, uh, Jewish religion. Uh, and so they were demanding uh, that all the men become circumcised, that they all uh, adhere to the dietary laws, um, and all the normal things involved with that. Uh, and if they didn't do that, they weren't Christian enough. Make sense? Now you can probably translate that pretty quick to one church you were at 20 years ago somewhere. You weren't Christian enough. And just fill in the blank of what you were told you had to do. You know, maybe you had to wear the different kind of clothes or, you know, uh, you know there were certain things you couldn't listen to, certain kinds of music or certain ways that you had to act or you couldn't say certain things. Uh, some churches, you know, still today, you know, it's your version of the Bible. You know, if, in, unless you have the right version of the Bible, eh, you know, you're not Christian enough. Right? And that happens, by the way, on both conservative and uh, non-conservative sides of the aisle, right? It, you know, remember what the idea is. You're not Christian enough unless, you know, you're part of this political party. And that can happen on both sides of the aisle. You're not Christian enough unless you adopt, you know, this liberal or this conservative belief. It happens on both sides of the aisle. Uh, but the problem isn't uh, the, the politics or the cultural liberal versus conservative, the politics, uh, the problem is that you have become part of a circumcision mentality. That you need to do these things and believe these things and look at things this way in order to be a real Christian. All right? So that's the circumcision party. And, and that Paul comes in and virtually devastates that and I'll give you a little line from Galatians because I'm trying to, I'm trying to get you to read it. And, and this is what Paul says. And I hope I don't... It's in the Bible, so if it offends you... Um, <laughs> he says, if circumcision really is good for you, why don't you cut it right off? It's in there. Read it. <laughs> right? If a little is good, a lot must be better. <laughs> it's in there. If circumcision is so good, emasculate yourself. You see what his argument is? It, it, you know, you can, in other words, you can never do enough. You can never do enough. And so, the, you know, we have the circumcision mentality. And circumcision mentality sort of has three things uh, at the root of it. it you know, you don't, want to get, you don't want to get too hunkered down in the particulars, you know, it, whether it's politics or culture or or fundamentalism versus uh, liberal Christianity. I mean, there's so many, you, you really can't keep up with all the fights if, if you're gonna try to do that, you'd, you'd get exhausted, right? So what's at the root of all of it? The, uh, the first problem is unbelief. Another, in other words, what do I mean by that? You, you lack confidence in what? Unbelief is lacking confidence in the finished work of Christ. So your real confidence is either in your political position or in your religious practice or in your, you know, your, 
your particular cultural expression or whatever it is, right? But what all of that is, and this is hard for people to understand, all of those things are an expression of unbelief. And what you're lacking is a belief in the finished work of Christ. And so you have to add something to Jesus. You have to add something to the gospel. You have to add something to the cross. So it's Jesus plus my political position. It's Jesus plus the King James Version of the Bible. It's Jesus plus abstinence from alcohol. It's Jesus plus never wearing a pair of pants to church. You know, it's Jesus, I mean, just all these things, right? It's Jesus plus something, all right? Jesus plus anything is not more belief, it's less belief, it's unbelief. You have stopped having your confidence in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Uh, the second thing is, uh, is called, it, it's law abuse. Uh, and remember, we did a whole thing on the difference between gospel and the law, but you know, let me remind you in kind of a real simple way, what's the law designed to do? To be a tutor towards Christ, right? All the law is supposed to do is you look at the law, and as we're going through the law on Sunday morning right now, and some of you are very probably relieved that this is the last Sunday of the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, because if they've done their work, you should be sitting here saying, I can't do any of those. <laughs> I've never, you know, I can't fulfill the Ten Commandments. Good. If that's what you're feeling, that's precisely what they're designed to do. They are a tutor to lead you to Christ so that you will not trust your righteousness, but you'll trust your substitute, Jesus Christ, and his righteousness to fulfill the law on your behalf and grant you that obedience as a gift. But when you don't, and when you lack confidence in the finished work of Christ, it becomes law abuse. And you're starting to run around and beating people over the head with the law of God. And when you're beating them over the head, you're not driving them to Jesus. You're saying, see, you need to do better. Well, he, they can't do better. They can't. They can't do better. What you need to do is talk to them about the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Uh, so that's the second thing. And, and then, and we'll talk about this as we move forward, but everybody becomes the holiness sheriff. And what do I mean by that? What we're going to learn next week is sanctification is equally the gift of God. It's not that you're saved by grace and then sanctified by your own effort. It's not as if that God saves you in his mercy and his grace and then says, okay, uh, now you're on your own. Pull yourself out by your bootstraps. You know, I got the plane up and running for you. You need to fly it and land this thing. And I hope it lands in the new heavens and the new earth. I hope you do well. <laughs> that's, that's not what it is. You are saved by grace and you are sanctified by grace. It's all the work of God. Uh, and so what happens in a circumcision mentality is that we begin to see ourselves as sanctification sheriffs, holiness sheriffs. And we think that our job is to run around and, and make sure everybody's sanctified. Uh, and people have names for this. And they'll say, well, I'm just a fruit inspector. You're not my fruit inspector, pal. I'll tell you what. <laughs> you know, forget it. I'm not doing that. So that's a circumcision mentality. Now... It's not, look what the verse says in Galatians 5, 6. Jesus Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. And remember who he's talking to. This is in Galatians. Now there's the uncircumcision mentality. Because on the other side of that, you would say, okay, if this is all wrong, it must be that the opposite of this is right. But that's equally wrong. Uh, so what, uh, and you're going to see, it's, what is the uncircumcision mentality? It's the same problem. First of all, it's unbelief. Jesus frees me from obedience. In other words, you don't believe that the righteousness of Jesus Christ conforms you to his image as a law keeper. It's the same unbelief problem. It's just expressed on the opposite side of the coin. It's just the extremity of the pendulum swing. Unbelief can either be uh, legalism or it can be license. Right? Unbelief can be expressed both ways. 
and you know we're we're most used to seeing uh, unbelief expressed as legalism, but unbelief is also expressed as license. When you believe you can do anything you want, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you have stopped believing in the true righteousness of Jesus Christ, because the righteousness of Jesus Christ was the righteousness of an obedient Christ, who changes you and conforms you into His image as a law keeper. And what he does now is that the law of God, instead of being something that drives you to the Christ, now because you're indwelt with his spirit, the law becomes sweet to your lips. You want the law of God. And it gives you the power to live the law of God. That's called sanctification. But it's always unbelief on the same side of it. I, I don't have to do this circumcision stuff. Uh, instead of law abuse, what that now means is it's law neglect, right? Hey, I'm a Christian. I can do anything I want. And you hear guys talk about this. Once saved, always saved. They call the church. Yeah, I'm down here uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm living with uh, uh, this woman and, and uh, she has a child and I have a couple of children and, uh, and I just got out of jail and, uh, you know, we need some money and it's, it's been really bad and I uh, just want you to know I'm a Baptist and I'm a Christian. Really? Well, apparently, you have trusted the righteousness of Jesus Christ, but the righteousness of Christ didn't change you. You're not attracted to the righteousness of Christ. Uh, sin is what, what do you call, uh, John calls sin. Sin is what? Lawlessness. All right? So you, it's not once saved, always saved, as people use that. They'll say once saved, always saved. I mean, I can do anything I want and still be a Christian. No, you can't. Because when Jesus enters your life through the work of the Spirit, he begins to change you into his image. You begin to look more and more like Jesus. Uh, do you remember uh, uh, what John said? They went out from us because they were what? They were never part of us. Uh, the sheep and the goats grow up together. The wheat and the tares grow up together. You don't know the difference, right? The only way you know the difference is in conformed lives. And, and we, so we don't neglect the law. It's just that we now have the Spirit of God who dwells in us, who ha helps us to live the law that we have no ability to live uh, in, in the flesh. We can't do it. And then, instead of being a holy uh, and sheriff, we have an in indulgence encourager. And what... What the, un, what the uncircumcision mentality says is, since Christ saved me and it's all of grace and it's all of mercy, you can do anything you want. You know, it's fine. Don't worry about it. He loves you just as you are. And it all sounds fabulous, doesn't it? Problem is, it's nothing to do with the Bible. The Bible changes you into a law keeper. Now, what's the problem with both of those uh, ways? You see what it says? For we, uh, we through his spirit are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. Neither of these two things produce righteousness in you, one way or another. Neither of them means anything in regard to the spiritual life. They are, they are sort of, uh, they're sort of a false front. They're a pretense. They won't get you where you need to go. Both ways lack the proper faith and what finally happens, but you see what it says? But what is the antidote for that? They don't mean anything, but what does mean something? Faith working through love. Why that reference to faith working? Remember, we're talking about working faith now. Faith that works. It's faith working through love because all of these things, if lacking the proper faith, they all, every one of these things become unloving, don't they? Uh, if you think about it, every one of the so, the, so the gospel not only saves you from disobedience, but the gospel equally saves you from your obedience. See what I mean? Uh, because what we think is, I've been obedient, don't I deserve to be reconciled to the Father? No, that's not what earned you your reconciliation. Christ's obedience earned you your reconciliation. So it's not your obedience or your disobedience. 
It's all a gift of God. We're going to see, we're going to see this in a minute. But the fact of the matter is, it's not, you know, unbelief is always unloving, no matter how it's expressed. If you're not expressing confidence in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you will either be come someone who abuses the law or someone who neglects the law with people. And you'll and both of those people will call it loving. I look, I spoke to him that way because I loved him. I, he just needed to hear it. You know? Mm -mm -mm. Or I didn't speak to him. Why would I talk to him like that? I love him. They all claim love. But it's ultimately we're going to see that it's unloving to to offer anything to anybody that is not the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing uh, that will produce uh, love. Uh, we, you know, whether we're the Holy Share or we're in, uh, in encouraging in indulgence. So neither legalism or license has any value at all for your spiritual life. The only thing that gives you any value is confidence in the genuine gospel, which is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that's real. So legalism is this. Legalism is love that demands conformity. You, can you condemn people and call it love. I love people enough to rebuke them. Well, aren't you something, tough guy? I love people enough to rebuke them. And then license is love that allows uh, sin to go unchecked. And so you're calling love really a lack of caring for people. You know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, you have a child who's a junkie and you're just not going to do anything about it because you love them so much. I'm going to yank that kid off uh, the street out from under the underpass I'm gonna throw him whether he likes it or not into a program and if I have to get an extraction team to do it I'm gonna do it that's love it, you know so we can we can call all kinds of things love but the fact of the matter is the only thing that produces that is the gospel of Christ all right so those are the two different mentality so now what what is the kind of faith that works any questions about that before we get into the kind of faith that works so what we do know is that neither one of these according to Galatians produce anything in our lives circumcision uncircumcision mentality those mentalities do not produce the gospel both of them so what does produce the gospel all right that's the question what's the third rail what's what, what's the path that really works all right and it's and it's the path of faith but remember faith not in faith but faith in the life death resurrection of jesus christ all right so let's talk about those three things we still have three right and keep my numbers up here so what you know, the gospel is, uh, you know, is the only thing that counts, in other words. Uh, it, it, it gives you all the righteousness you need, if I can put it that way. Uh, at the root of all of our lives is this problem that righteousness is not enough gospel. We need to do a little bit more, right? And what we need to do is begin to put all of our faith in the completed work of Christ, in the finished work of Christ. So true faith always rests in his, Christ, uh, in his righteousness. Uh, and we don't receive it uh, because we uh, don't believe in the real righteousness, Christ. We don't receive it because we believe in a false righteousness. That's what our struggle is. Say, well, I am believing. Yeah, but you're not believing in Christ. And remember, this is when, 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 when someone says to you at this stage of your life, you're not believing in Christ. No one is saying you're not a Christian. That's not what theologians are saying to you. They're saying to you that on a daily basis that you are not really putting your deepest hope and confidence in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Even though you've come to him, even though, yes, uh, you've accepted him as your personal savior, the reason that your sanctification is on the slow track is because each and every moment of the day, you have an opportunity to either do one or two things. You're either putting your confidence in the righteousness of Christ or you're putting confidence in the flesh. There's no middle ground. And every one of your decisions is that. Every one of your actions is that. Every form of speech is that. And that's what always gets us into trouble. 
And when, you know, when something really goes sideways, it's easy to see, right? You know, we can kind of go along and say, yeah, okay, you know, things are going well. But when, when a situation really blows up, maybe a, you know, a, a, a friend's marriage goes sideways and you have a, tr a chance to see both of them at the same time, it's pretty easy to see that this is true, isn't it? And so every once in a while, the Lord gives you an opportunity to look and say, oh, that, that's the real problem. Yeah, but that's the real problem with you, too. Right? That's the real problem with you, too. So make, these, you know, make sure these moments are teaching moments. So what is faith that works? It's not faith separated from its object. It's not faith as a psychological phenomenon. It's faith that is believing 100% of the time in the righteousness of Christ. And that's going to result in three things. It's always the righteousness of Christ. And if you have to think about it this way, it's always the righteousness of Christ that is at stake. That's what you're either throwing overboard or keeping. And the minute that you sort of grasp that in your head, uh, that's the minute uh, that some of this stuff will become clear and you realize that, that a lifestyle of repentance is sort of what we have to do. So it's faith with the, first of all, it's faith with the proper object. It's faith with the proper object. So it's not just a matter of believing anything you want. You have to believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the minute that I say believe in the right life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, do you now know enough? Because where would you find out about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Yeah, in the scriptures. Uh, and, and, and the position is that Jesus... Uh, is God who took on human flesh. So you're saying, I wonder what God, and people ask this, you know, rhetorically, I wonder what God thinks about and fill in the b cultural blank. Well, go read Jesus and you'll find out. Because he's God. Everything you need to know about God, you see in Jesus. And so the only way to flesh out what you're trusting in and what you're putting your hope in is through the scriptures. You see what it says? For through the Spirit by faith, we're waiting for the hope of righteousness. So this is the work of the Spirit, that we do something, listen, if I say we do something by faith, uh, it, and it's hard to get our head around, but if I say we do something by faith, it's another way of saying we do nothing at all. Faith is received. Faith does nothing. Faith, uh, the very nature of faith is to receive the righteousness of Christ. Faith is an empty hand. And so the, it's the work of believing. It's the work of putting your hope and your confidence, all of that in the receipt of the gift of God for us. In his righteousness. And the minute you say that, that is difficult, isn't it? Because that's not our instinct. It's not what we want to do. What I think probably many of you are saying to yourself, okay, this is great. Finally, he's going to tell me what faith, what I need to do for faith. And that's the instinct that Jesus is trying to root a rooter out of your heart. Because the act of faith is the act of you doing nothing. It's the act of putting all your confidence in what Christ is doing for you right now through his spirit. Confidence for what? Confidence that you are reconciled to the Father. Am I or am I not in this moment a child of God? Am I or am I not reconciled to the Father? Am I or am I not right now in the presence of God? And if you answer that question any other way but yes, I'm in the presence of God because I've done nothing, but I've put all my confidence in the receiving of the gift of his presence, the gift of his spirit, the gift of his righteousness, and so my confidence and my hope in the fact that I'm reconciled to the Father, I'm okay with God, that I'm present with him now. He hasn't abandoned me, I'm not alone. 
uh, that I am walking in a manner worthy of the calling, calling of what? The calling of Christ Jesus, who called you to himself. That's what it means to walk in a manner worthy. It's not, uh, you're not worthy of the calling, you're walking in a manner worthy of the calling that's already happened. You don't call and then walk. I mean, you call and then walk, you don't walk and then get the call. So faith is, the very nature of faith is to receive. So working through faith means instead of achieving something for ourselves, we're receiving something from Christ. Uh, what, is the, what is the opposite of achie achieving is what? It's achieving versus receiving. This is the bottom line of the Christian life. In every moment you're saying to yourself, um, Jesus likes me more if I'll act like this in the next 10 minutes. The minute you say that, you're also saying Jesus will like me less if I don't. And I'm putting that in the vernacular, but that's what it means to be reconciled to God. God is not my heavenly father in this moment because I did fill in the blank. And let's make it something really horrible. Really bad. And, you know, don't blurt it out, we're on tape, but just think about it in your head. What if last night I got caught doing now, feeling something really bad? Would you be less reconciled to the Father? Would your justification be any less in the moment of your deepest sin? Are you any less justified in the moment when you're breaking the Ten Commandments? Are you less justified in that moment? If you feel, think, or otherwise come to the conclusion that you are, you are still on the achieving side, not the receiving side. Because justification is the gift of God regardless. Look, don't you think he knew what you were going to do when he justified you? Justification is the one-time forensic declaration of God that you are now right with God. Don't you think what he knew what you were going to do on Calvary? He knew what you were going to do on Friday night. He knew what you were going to do with that girl. He knew what you were going to do with that guy. You don't think he knew that? You don't think he knew you were going to go off the rails? You don't think he knew you were going to steal that money? You don't think he knew? By grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And our tendency is to want to achieve reconciliation with the Father. And we don't achieve anything in faith. We receive everything in faith. That's what it means. We're working through faith means instead of achieving something, you're receiving something. And so every minute of the day, you're saying, my outside helper is who? The Spirit of God. I will send you a... What did Jesus say? I will send you a helper. And the Spirit of Christ will dwell in you. And as the Spirit of Christ dwells in you, He quickens you. What does that mean? What does it mean to quicken you? It means it brings you to life. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead will dwell in you. And so that same resurrected Spirit of Christ now dwells in you. So that all you have to do is let go of achievement. And receive with an empty hand the righteousness of Christ the reconciliation, the gift of reconciliation that the Father has given you, and the very fact that you're no longer alienated, you're adopted into the family of God. And when you believe that, you begin to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Won't that change the way you look at things? Won't that change the way you feel? Won't that change how you treat people? Won't that change everything, right? And that, so that, everything we've just been talking about is faith as what? Faith as gift. If, if we don't understand that faith is the gift of God, you're always going to be on the achieving side of this, this problem. 100% of the time, you'll never get over it. And what that will produce in your life, you know, when Jesus said, be anxious for nothing, he, he wasn't being, you know, Freud Jr., he was saying that the result of not trusting me and receiving everything that I have to give you will produce anxiety in you. 
because you'll always be thinking, I'm not reconciled to the Father. I'm alienated from God. I am not in the family of God. Uh, my morality is not good enough. Uh, and Jesus will now uh, reject me. Stipulated, your morality is not good enough. It will never be good enough. When will that get good enough? You'll never have perfect morality. No one walking in the face of the earth has perfect morality. The only person who did that was our substitute, Jesus Christ, who perfectly obeyed the law of God, which is the only way we know he has perfect morality. There's no morality outside of the law of God, you understand. Okay, read your newspaper and think about what I just said again. All morality is determinative by the law of God. If it doesn't conform to the law of God, it is by definition immoral and therefore ungodly. All right? The final thing is faith as the power of the indwelling spirit. You say, where do I get the power of faith? Because, you know, you, know, you just kick, when you, when you ask the question that way, you just kick in the can down the road towards achievement again. All right, because some people will have more power to do this faith and some people have, you're right back into the achievement side of the equation again. Where does this power come from? Through the spirit by faith, we wait for the hope of righteousness. In other words, the entire work of the Spirit is to empower you to believe in a righteousness that's alien to you. That is the work of the Spirit. That is what He is doing in your life. That is what uh, causes you to believe in Jesus Christ. You don't uh, believe in Jesus Christ and then you're given the Spirit. The Spirit comes and changes your heart and then you believe. Without the Spirit, you wouldn't have believed anything. But the same Spirit that caused you to believe in Christ is the same Spirit that continues to cause you to believe in Christ. And so the Christian life isn't a matter of, of having a single moment of ecstatic belief in some historical moment in your life and calling that Christianity. The Christian life, the normal Christian life, is an ongoing, perpetual, daily, minute by minute indwelling of the Spirit where you're changed and conformed to a new identity. And now your identity is the image of Jesus Christ. And that indwelling Spirit, moment by moment, is causing you to believe and not achieve. And that will make you less anxious. It will make you less hard on other people. It will make <laughs> all kinds of things it will do for you if you will trust that truth. So that, that's what it means to have a faith that works. It's an empty hand that receives the gift of faith. Is faith as the proper object of Jesus? Is faith as a gift, not as an achievement? And is faith as the power of the Spirit, not the power of human effort? Make sense? All right. Because it's important to get this because next week we have to talk about sanctification and how it really works. And sanctification, the ongoing, the, the ability of uh, the Spirit to change you so that you look more like Jesus every day is not possible without this. It will just be the equivalent of the coach telling you to take another lap. Take some more laps. All right? You, you'll need this. All right. Any questions about that? We'll pick it up next week. All right. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you again uh, for what you've done. You have indwelled us with your spirit. You've given us the gift of faith so that we not, might believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We no longer have to achieve our, our adoption. We can't earn it. Uh, our effort will not produce uh, the adoption as sons and daughters of God. But thanks be to God for your grace and mercy. You have folded us into the family of God and we are now one with you. And I pray that you will make this more and more true in our lives each and every moment of the day for Christ's sake. Amen.